So, do you want a bullet heaven based around running around in the dark with a flashlight? Well, then you might want to play Disfigure, and I'll be honest, this game did almost miss out on a review because of its simplicity, in spite of being free to play. That is, until I got an oddly high number of requests to look at it from the community. So I figured, what the hell, let's give it a nice little review, and then I started digging deeper. And there's a bit more of a discussion to be had here than I thought at first glance. First off, it's pretty much exactly what you'd expect from the genre. You start with a character, or in this case one of ten weapons, from a list you unlock by playing, and you kill off swarms of mobs. Plain, simple, and straightforward. It uses fairly bog-standard WASD controls, mouse aiming, the ability to set it to auto-shoot or to just completely destroy your left mouse button by clicking. And you can even switch between a circular and a cone-shaped light with your right mouse button and have skills even based off of using these. So it seems fairly run-of-the-mill and a quick access for most people who just want an easy-to-grab cathartic experience with a little bit of a challenge. The progression loop is similarly run-of-the-mill, with points gained by picking up experience in the game and then spending it to unlock new weapons, which, while using the same core abilities on normal levels, do actually have their own custom upgrade trees specific to them, that you get access to every 10th level. The game very much has the vibes of someone who enjoyed the genre deciding to just take their first foray into making games by making one of their own. With only one level, and once you've finished one run, you'll have seen all the enemies available, so the only variables between runs are a bit of RNG for level up upgrades and your choice of base weapon, of course, which will decently impact how you play, at least in the first handful of level ups. Now, it may seem up to this point that I'm saying this game is really average, and that would be pretty on the nose. But don't get me wrong, it's fun, the weapons are varied enough to be enjoyable, the enemies can get challenging as you progress, and basically Disfigure set out to do one thing, and did it competently enough that it is cathartic to play. And that is all a game needs to be sometimes. The deeper discussion on this title though comes from three places. Accessibility, the creation process, and how games like this make money. That last one is actually a fairly nice green check mark for Disfigure. It's a free to play game that has DLC options that you can buy on Steam, that are just a tip to the developer to say that you got enjoyment out of it and you want to fund further development. If you want to donate more to the continued development, you can go to their website as well. But this is all a fair ask if you enjoyed it, and an easy way to compensate them for their work if you can spare the cost of a coffee. The other two are a bit more of a mixed bag, though the developer has been improving the title with accessibility options as the game continues to age. I would still say to avoid this if you have epilepsy or any similar aversion to flashing lights, with the melee weapons being especially bad about this due to their animations. This is because it is a black and white game with high contrast, and the only colors you get to change are that of your character and the crosshair. Beyond that, the only other color in the game is green, which is the enemy projectiles. Now, by default, the game also has a lot of bad settings turned on for people with vision and motion sickness issues, so you have to be sure to jump into the options menu and look at those before you even try playing. In special effects, the film grain and VHS scan lines are just personal taste, but the important things to consider are camera movement, screen shake, and chromatic aberration. The aberration will be people who have an aversion to flashing lights but are not epileptic specifically, since this causes a bit of chroma to be involved on the effects, which, while cool and flashy, can greatly increase the impact of the flashing lights on those prone to issues with it. The screen shake is a fairly obvious one and one of the more common settings for people with motion sickness, so it should be disabled if you have any form of simulator sickness unless you've taken your Dramamine today. The real big one though is the camera movement option. This is because of how this game's default targeting is. Unlike most games in this genre where the camera is locked on your character, this setting gives your camera movement more akin to Hotline Miami where the center of your screen is going to be halfway between your cursor and your character, resulting in wild swaying and weaving, and is one reason why a lot of people flat out cannot play Hotline Miami without getting ill. I actually overlooked this option on my first time through, thinking that turning off special effects would be all I needed, and was one reason I almost flat out dropped this game because it knocked me out of commission for the rest of the day, after only a 20 minute session. But with that option disabled, it did become a bit more accessible but still gave me a couple bits of wooziness. Now the last one is that creation process, and one I was not aware of until after I went digging around looking for solutions to the camera swaying issue. And that is how the game actually uses a decent number of AI generated assets, 
admittedly from one that self-proclaims to be ethical, but is still questionable at best. Now, the character and the monsters do not appear to be AI generated, just the level up icons and upgrade icons, which is one reason they are so jarring in style compared to the actual gameplay. The ethics of this are an odd thing to encounter, because this type of stuff is even cropping up in paid games and is overall a detriment to the industry as a whole, even if they do make it easier for solo devs or devs with a lack of resources to quickly churn out assets. This is because, by excusing it for budget or independent studios, we also lose our ground to defend against it when larger, more established AA and AAA studios start diving into it and cutting out the artists in the middle, which will ultimately lead to visual stagnation when it comes to art assets, stilted and formulaic dialogue when it comes to large language models, loss of skilled voice actors able to make a living, and the loss of composers and musicians who are able to make unique atmospheres. These type of assets, which by using you do help train, not only work off of the theft of assets without creator permissions usually, but also move the space to a more homogenized mess, resulting in lower quality, more vanilla content in games. So unless you want all your games to be really average, there really is no ground to support this type of generation even from a purely consumer standpoint that is apathetic to those who spent time creating it. Now, in terms of this specific game, I'm giving it a temporary pass on that because the AI angle is an interesting subject if you really want to deep dive into it on more than just a pretty picture standpoint. But if there wasn't the demand for it, I probably would not have covered this either because I have blacklisted some other games, even ones that appeared previously on the channel, when they started utilizing unethical aspects like AI in their design principles and even rug pull NFTs in their monetization aspects. So summary in short, it's a decent enough game, free to play, fun for a good handful of runs, and worth trying if you just want to see if you like the most basic form of Bullet Heavens. And it's one I give a pass to for now, thanks to it being free, and because it is one of the more safe options when it comes to broaching the topic that is also creeping into paid games. And that is the aspect of AI being a drain on creative content, just like microtransactions were on design content.